can get started. I'm Jan Martinson, the president of the local chapter. I see familiar faces and some new ones, so welcome. I will introduce our speaker, Steve. Steve Carey drove all the way up from Santa Fe. Steve is now retired, but he spent 30 years with the state in um, the state of New Mexico in resource management. He's always been passionate about butterflies. He's known as the butterfly guy. He did speak to this group about five, no, probably 2009. That's when your book came out. I think you spoke even before that. So he had published a book in 2009 about the butterflies of New Mexico, which is a beautiful book. Um, all of us are interested in gardening to attract butterflies because butterflies are so pretty. But if you don't attract the caterpillars, you're not going to have the butterflies. So Steve's going to tell us about that. Everybody got to see this, right? Thank you, you're welcome. Hey there, everybody. Hi. <sighs> really great to be here. Thanks for the introduction, Jan. Uh, yeah, I drove all the way from Santa Fe. Must have taken me an hour. <laughs> uh, let's see. You brought the wind with you. And do, is there a magical changer? Yes, it's here. Okay. I did bring. I think it's the up and down. The up and down. Try it. Or you tell me next slide, please. How about I do it? Great. So the talk tonight is a uh, very controversial subject for gardeners. Yeah, put the lights down. Caterpillars. How many are here to protest the talk? <laughs> um, <clears throat> so. Uh, uh, my talk is basically going to be kind of uh, revolving, rotating around this, uh, the Lepidoptera life cycle. And uh, probably no surprise uh, to you guys, uh, since you're gardeners, you deal with insects all the time. But insects have a pretty complicated life cycle. And uh, insects include butterflies, and I'm the butterfly guy, so I have to talk about that. Um, the adult stage for butterflies uh, flaps around and flies, and drinks nectar from flowers that produce nectar, uh, and looks for mates and mate, and mates. That's what the adult stage does. Uh, Mating females place eggs on plants. Eggs hatch into itty bitty caterpillars that eat the plants. They eat enough, they get to be big caterpillars. And uh, if they haven't been parasitized, they get to uh, pupate. Uh, in the chrysalis, and again, if uh, all goes well, uh, an adult will emerge out of this chrysalis, and we have then completed the life cycle. Um, so, a couple of things that I want us to remember as we go along this evening about the life cycle. One of them is related to the process of females uh, placing eggs on plants. Each species of butterfly, and each species of moth, for that matter, has its own menu of plants that its caterpillars will eat. Okay? So, not just any plant will do. This is the fulvia checker spot, and fulvia checker spots place their eggs on paintbrushes of Castilea genus. And so uh, that's what has happened here. Each of these little dots is a butterfly egg. And if a uh, female were by luck or bad software, place her eggs on uh, something other than a paintbrush, the caterpillars would hatch and they would be looking around for food and they would not find it and they would starve. So um, other butterflies, of course, have other host plants. I heard some discussion earlier this evening about monarch butterflies. What what uh, plants do monarch butterflies lay their eggs on? Milkweed. Uh, very good. Um, and you name a butterfly and there's a host plant. It might be one species of plant. It might be a genus. It might be a family. It might be a collection of things that uh, are deciduous or that bloom at the same time of year. But it's some menu, some restricted menu of plants. Okay? Very important. And the second thing that I want you to uh, remember uh, as we go through the talk tonight is uh, 
uh, a female butterfly will generally place about 300 eggs uh, in, you know, after mating and before she dies. And those 300 eggs represent, just for simplicity's sake, let's just say genetic input from her and one male. It's usually more complicated than that, but not too much more complicated. So, um, and uh, so there's a lot of eggs and uh, there's a lot of uh, pressure, a lot of predator pressure on this whole life cycle here. Most of it happens in this stage right here. Because not all those caterpillars, not all those 300 will live to survive. Otherwise we'd be overrun with butterflies. That should be terrible. Thank you. Okay, so just to summarize here, uh, females play, uh, the important parts of this are the females place eggs, uh, and I, I consider that to be a sacred relationship between uh, an herbivore and the plant. Uh, okay, it's, 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 it's essential, it's been going on for millennia, and uh, it does not get disrupted very easily. And the second thing is that uh, caterpillars feed a lot of things. Okay? Next, please. I've already talked about all this. I'm going to try to show you some pictures of caterpillars as we go along. Um, I don't have a lot of caterpillar photographs. Uh, they don't photograph very easily. But this is an orange sulfur caterpillar right here. It's a little larger than life. <laughs> it's really about how big? Uh, maybe an inch long. Oh. <laughs> um, Okay, so we've talked about this. These ancient relationships go back millions of years. Each is adapted to the other. Plants, of course, are trying to not get chewed on. Butterflies are, uh, at least the caterpillar stage, uh, that part of their life cycle is designed to figure it out one way or the other. Next. And uh, this is a western tiger swallowtail larva here. You guys have those around here, too. I tried to pick ones that you actually have around here. And uh, you can see it's a nice attempt to look like a leaf. Um, well, you know, if there's a predator around, caterpillars don't really have an escape. Uh, so some of the adaptations are to look like you're not edible, to look like something inedible, to look dangerous. Some of them have some uh, defensive chemicals they can uh, spit out. Um, there's a lot of critters out there that are looking for a snack. Next. Sorry? What plant was that? Was that uh, that was, uh, can you back up one, or was that, are we risking nuclear meltdown? Um, this is probably, uh, probably a choke chair. Um, yeah, that's, this is, uh, western tiger swallowtails are one of the butterflies that like deciduous uh, deciduous shrubs, deciduous trees. Okay, next one. <clears throat> Is that the one that stings? There's one that kind of stings. This one here? Yeah. This is a red admiral. It would like you to think that it stings. Yeah. Um, so these little protuberances here, uh, tubercles, are not hairs, but they are kind of, it's not a great photograph, but they are kind of pointy and pokey and they are parasitoid uh, defenses, def parasitoid repellers. Uh, parasitoid wasps and flies are always looking for, females are always looking for places to lay eggs. And uh, Lepidoptera larvae are typically the target. Um, so a lot of uh, butterflies in this family, the brushfoot family, have these pokey, uh, think of the, uh, uh, defenses on the Normandy beaches for D-Day, you know, all these things that are trying to keep out the good guy. Well, in that case, the good guys. But here, of course, it's the butterfly that's the good guy. Um, all right, so I kind of set you up for this uh, little test here. Uh, if a female butterfly places 300 eggs, representing the DNA from two adults, and the population isn't changing over time from one year to the next, how many of those 300 larvae survive to reproduce? Two. I know I've asked you this before, so it's really a memory test for a lot of people. So you did well. Two. 
Two survive out of 300, which means that 298 get gobbled. And uh, that's why I call them kind of a fodder for the food chain. Uh, and we'll come back to this theme a little bit later. Go ahead. And just a little uh, kind of esoteric uh, thing here that we're looking at when we have, we're talking about a plant, we're talking about a caterpillar and a predator, uh, we have a food chain. Very simple food chain. Next. And um, I guess I want to uh, emphasize, this is a gray hair street caterpillar, by the way. Does anybody, anybody know the gray hair street? Yeah, it's very pretty. It's about that big, half inch long. Hair streaks are pretty small. Uh, and the gray hair streak caterpillars will eat, they're about the most uh, uh, polyphagous. They'll eat almost anything. <coughs> they're, they're at one end. Uh, most butterflies aren't like that. Uh, and I guess what I want to stress here is that uh, it's easy for us to simplify a food chain, say plant, rabbit, fox, or plant, rabbit, coyote, or plant, butterfly, uh, uh, spider. But this process, this uh, tra transfer, uh, transfer of energy uh, from plants, which capture energy from the sun, to an herbivore uh, is very important, because uh, that basically allows the rest of the food chain to survive. And most of the herbivores, the primary consumers, are insects. The vast, overwhelming, however you want to count it, numbers, species, richness, weight, uh, they're mostly insects. So this is a hugely important process in our ecosystems. And we're talking about butterflies because that's my thing, but there's a whole lot of other insects that are chewing on the plants too. You guys probably know that. Right? Yeah. It's occurred to you. Um, so uh, it's, a, it's a real, um, it's big, way more important than the rabbits and other, you know, vertebrate herb herbivores. The invertebrates are uh, really much more important. Go ahead. Okay, next. Again? Again, yeah, sorry. Okay. Sometimes I just talk to myself while I'm preparing these talks. Okay. Um, okay. So this is a wren, and the wren has in its beak a caterpillar. I have no idea what species of caterpillar. It's probably a moth. Um, and we've, uh, earlier we kind of looked at butterfly life cycle and talked about the fate of larvae from the butterfly's perspective, which is that most of the kids get eaten. Um, and uh, go ahead, next slide. You hang out at Audubon and you talk to ornithologists and you all of a sudden you see the bird perspective. Which is like this. Uh, terrestrial migratory birds, which will be arriving any old time, eat their young a diet that is 90% insects. And most of that is caterpillars. I, have, I feed birds in my yard. I have a, a bath. I have a seed blocks. I have seeds. How many of you feed birds? So what happens in the springtime? You've been feeding your birds through the winter. Um, new birds start to arrive. Feed them a little bit in the spring. What happens about late spring? Well, I tell you what happened at Audubon is the birds kind of disappeared. I mean, they're around, you know, but the, our filling up of the feeders was, uh, you know, we didn't need to fill them as often. A lot less food was being consumed. And the reason is because bird, adult parent birds need to feed their young protein. And they don't get protein from nuts and seeds. They don't get it from suet. They don't get it from, how many birds don't get it from nectar? So from a bird's perspective, that's why butterflies and moths exist, is to help them raise their families. Next year. And, um, it still kind of uh, blew my mind, uh, so I'll repeat it. It might not be news to you, but uh, when songbirds arrive in spring, they're looking for places to make nests. And like humans, they're looking for a nice, nice neighborhood, a uh, place with good schools, good stores, uh, you know, a good place to uh, uh, fly around. 
Um, and good homes for birds, of course, are good places to build nests. And good nest sites are ones that have a lot of food close at hand. And that means lots of uh, butterfly and moth larvae. That's not a butterfly and moth larvae in the bird's beak there. But it is a nice picture. Go ahead, yeah. next. And so if you're a bird, you're looking for larvae. Where are you going to find them? Where the butterflies are hatching. Where the butterflies have laid the eggs. You are, uh, yes, that's right. Go ahead. Let's, I don't even know what the next slide is. Okay, and so where are the butterflies and moths laying their eggs? And you know when Audubon, who's a bird conservation organization, when they put it in their big ma in their magazine, uh, that you want that they want you to create a bird-friendly yard. That uh, small habitats can make a big difference, and the way you can make a big difference, create a bird-friendly yard, is to yeah, native, yeah. yay, native plants. Very good, and I know you guys are the choir, so I apologize for preaching. Um, yeah, so native plants is where the, where the butterflies and moths are going to be looking to place their eggs. So that is where the birds are going to be looking to build their nests. Um, what's next? So just kind of uh, these ancient relationships uh, are now have ramifications for the whole food chain. And because these plants and these butterflies and these moths have been working on each other for so long, um, you bring in an alien plant and <coughs> nobody in the neighborhood recognizes it. Nobody can recognize it chemically or whatever. And so there aren't that many insects that will chew on most alien plants. Alien, exotic, whatever you want to say. Uh, so native plants are the keys, really, to, um, uh, well, what's a better way to say that? Uh, if you want habitat in your yard, you can't get it with non-native plants. Next. And I do want to say something about moths. Um, butterflies are pretty charismatic. Most moths are not. Uh, some of them are. Uh, the problem with moths is that there's so, so many different kinds. It just boggles the mind. Uh, how many of you know Eric Metzler, who's a moth guy down in Alamo, Gordo? He comes to Native Plant Society meetings probably mostly in southern New Mexico, but he is uh, New Mexico's moth expert, and he's probably in the, clearly in the top ten in uh, North America. And he says, uh, he studies the micro moths. The micro moths are the itty bitty, teeny tiny ones that all look the same. And uh, so he's got a pretty good perspective. He says that the number of moth species probably is at least 20 times, probably, possibly 50 times as great as the number of butterfly species. We have 300 butterfly species in New Mexico. Um, so there could be as many as 15,000 you know, different moth species. Uh, and he says there's so few people studying them and there's so many that we'll never, we'll never know them all. There are too many. Um, so even though I'm talking about butterflies and their relationships with native plants, you need to also be, keep in mind that moths have those relationships too. And there's you know, 99, is that right? 95%, 98% of all Lepidoptera are moths. So. I hear some really nice moth caterpillar pictures, huh? Spectacular little keep away type things. I don't know what this or that or that is, but I do know what that is. That is the um, northern giant flag moth, which also is quite beautiful. Next. Okay, next. Uh, yeah, well, let me just recapitulate that. So when I say gardening for caterpillars, really it's just kind of a shorthand way to say that you're gardening for your ecosystem. You're gardening for caterpillars because, yes, you want butterflies. And, uh, yeah, I guess we want moths too, not, maybe just because we like them, but also because they're going to feed the birds and the bats uh, in the case of moths and everything else. Um, so I do want to also give you a little um, more specific information. 
because I'm going to want you to do some stuff at the end of the talk. So go ahead. Um, I forgot to mention there's a really nice book. If you're really interested in learning about caterpillars in the early stages of butterfly life cycles, it's called Caterpillars in the Field and Garden. It's probably about 10 years old now, but it's a field guide to butterfly caterpillars of North America. And uh, one of the authors is Jim Brock, Jim Brock, Jeff Glassberg, these are big name guys, illustrated with photos. Uh, so if you want to know more, that's a good place to start. Uh, Jan mentioned this great New Mexico butterfly book. Yeah. <laughs> and then the third book I want to mention to you that this little analysis I'm going to go through in the next few slides is kind of based on this book that I read. It's called Bringing Nature Home. Anybody seen that one? Yeah. It's by Douglas Tallamy. And uh, its uh, subtitle is How You Can Sustain Wildlife with Native Plants. Now, Tallamy, uh, this just kind of, uh, well, like I said, I guess my mind is pretty easily blown because uh, this book blew my mind. Um, He's an eastern guy, and so this book is based on eastern plants, eastern forests, and eastern moths. But um, it doesn't take too much imagination to extrapolate to the, the western U.S. or to New Mexico. And you see the ramifications of uh, you know, the spread of invasive plants, uh, the loss of native ecosystems, and uh, the loss, uh, you know, kind of the ripples that that sends up through the ecosystem. But what uh, Tallamy did for the eastern U.S. Uh, generally is he, uh, he looked at different plant families and he has a whole research team, graduate students, etc. So his analysis is a little more sophisticated than mine. But. And then he looked at uh, which moth species were eating those you know, plants in those families. So. And, and of course, moths, as I said, way outnumber butterflies, and so his numbers were off the charts. Uh, whereas for me and butterflies, which is what I know, they're pretty modest numbers. But if you look here at the top, uh, so I've got plant families over here, and the number of butterfly species, these caterpillars eat plants in that family. And so starting at the top, um, I've highlighted with a colored uh, uh, background there that uh, the grass family, there's 65 butterf New Mexico butterflies, 65 species of New Mexico butterflies whose caterpillars eat grasses. Okay. Uh, the pea family is next. 41 species of New Mexico butterflies uh, eat plants in the pea family, the legumes. And you can read on down the list to the, uh, uh, the polygonaceae. What's the common name for them? Buckwheats. Buckwheats. Uh, the beech family, which includes the oaks, asters, mustards, willows, rose family, sedges, uh, snapdragon family, agaves. And then, of course, it just a lot of, there are a lot of plant families that have you know, a small number of butterflies uh, eating, whose caterpillars eat them. And remember, we're talking about caterpillars now, not adults looking for nectar at flowers. Any questions about what this might mean? And what I'm going to do in the next few slides is I'm going to look at uh, plant genera. I was thinking I might just move my lips and see, <laughs> see if I could sell that. <laughs> Probably wouldn't work. I don't speak Italian. So, grasses, I mean, that really surprises me. Why is that? You just think they go to flowers. Well, and the adults pretty do go to, flowers. The adults do go to flowers. So, but the ones females that, looking to place eggs. So grasses are more for the egg laying. All of these are for egg laying. Egg laying, right. We're not talking about flowers but, and adults getting nectar from flowers or pollination. We're not talking about that tonight. We're talking about placement of eggs and caterpillars okay. munching. Yep. Yep. And mostly native grasses. You've and because there's a lot of non-natives around too. Well, there are now. Yeah. Didn't used to be. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
Okay, so these colored ones, we're going to see these families again in the next slide, uh, which looks at uh, the genus. Okay, try to tries to break it down a little bit so you can you can see uh, again how many different butterfly New Mexico butterfly species are supported by. And the top genus out of all the plants in New Mexico in terms of the number of butterflies supported, grandma grasses. They kick butt. And I have to say that, you know, when the numbers on the, in the right-hand column, that's just as far as we know. And we don't know every host plant for every butterfly. So uh, there's probably more. Uh, so, grammar grasses are extremely, extremely important. Fortunately, it's a, there are a lot of them, uh, and a lot of them are very widespread. What's next on the list? Oak. Quercus. That was a big one for Ptolemy in the east as well. He really looked at woody plants in the east. It's back east, there's a huge species richness in trees, deciduous trees, that we don't have. Um, uh, but for him, in the east, it was all about the oaks. And you can kind of see that reflected a little bit here in New Mexico. Um, what oak do you have around Taos? Gamble oak. All right. Maybe we'll see that one again. Um, so, and oaks also, just you probably know this also, but uh, hugely important for other wildlife species as well. They have edible seeds. And... Uh, if you want to know the approximate number of moss species uh, that are represented by this, and it won't be a, you know, always an exact 20 or 50 times, but uh, we're talking hundreds of moss species are eating grama grass. They're larvae. 100 uh, moss species have their larvae eating oaks. Hundreds. Two or three hundred. And then you get down into the buckwheats again. I find that mind-blowing myself. Out of all the plant families, out of all the genera, why the buckwheats? Um, and then, you, you, then uh, all these other green ones, these are other grasses. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's one of my favorites. Here are the violets. Willows are here. Questions about this? Okay, next slide. And then I, I uh, did, you know, more strictly what Ptolemy did by looking at woody plants only. <coughs> so there are no grasses in this analysis. It's just woody plant genera hosting New Mexico butterfly larvae. And then oak is at the top. I call the buckwheats woody. Somebody else might not. Um, but all of a sudden, you start seeing things like uh, choke cherry and uh, locust and uh, hackberry, cottonwoods and aspens, ash, pine, gooseberry. Well, we're down to two, but, uh, but you can see. What is, anyway. what's Ceanothus? Ceanothus? Um, that is Fendler's buckbrush, the buckbrushes. Ceanothus fendleri is what you have here, Fendler's mm -hmm. buckbrush. Fendler's. Okay. It's a really nice fire climax shrub. shrub. Go ahead, next. So, you know, I read Ptolemy's book and I thought, well, we need to go, we just need to go plant oaks everywhere. Gamble's oak, uh, whatever it is. And I know that's not practical uh, because oaks don't grow everywhere and uh, they also don't grow very fast. Uh, so you have to be thinking way out there. But um, for people who live in oaky habitats, any of you live in an oaky habitat? Too far up the hill, okay. Uh, well, when you're in the oaks, think about, think about all the Lepidoptera that are chewing on the leaves. Uh, hmm. Formatting is a little fun, but Colorado hair streak. Right here, there's the larva. 
two or, two or three dusky wings. Sleepy dusky wing is one example. That's a skipper. You guys have seen Arizona Sisters, right? Yeah? Yeah. So here's the caterpillar. Go ahead, next. And uh, the buck brushes, the areogonums, are really too complicated to go into any great detail. But um, I have some of those at my house. I know there are things that, well, there are things that you should be planting at your house. Or in your business, or if there's some public spaces. And just this one species, uh, James's buck brush, or antelope brush, um, hosts these two itty bitty butterflies, about thumbnail size, or maybe smaller. Here's the Mormon metal mark caterpillar, adult. Square spotted blue, right there is the caterpillar. There's the adult. And if you went through how many different species of Eriogonum do you have in Taos County? I didn't hear, sorry. I have no idea. Oh, no idea. <laughs> Probably a lot. 20? That could be right. 20. It's a very, very rich genus. I think there are probably 250 species in the Four Corner States, something like that. Hugely diverse, and uh, there are some really cool one-to-one -one relationships between butterfly, butterfly species and Eriogonum species, where uh, that's, it's one species eats one species. Um, and if you decide you want to do some plantings, I know you're already doing plenty of plantings and you don't need me to tell you to do more, but um, try to pick something that's already in your neighborhood and plant a lot of it. <coughs> Next slide, please, Jim. Here's Fendler's Buck Rush. Um, and there are probably half a dozen species statewide of butterflies. These caterpillars eat Fendler's Buck Rush. Here's the pale swallowtail. A bird dropping mimic as a larva. A California tortoise shell, another one with pokey defenses. Uh, the bramble hair streak. Um, here in New Mexico, uh, we found a second post plant for that. Here's the caterpillar right here. And uh, yeah, okay. This one's hard to get. I'm trying to figure out how to, if I can, I've got some seeds and trying to germinate them, but they don't germinate easily because they have paraffin coating on them. They usually need a fire to come along and melt the paraffin before water can penetrate the seed and germinate it. So I'm trying to figure out how to do that. It's a really important plant. Next. Well, we talked about blue grama grass, so here are some of the our grassland butterflies. Um, Unca skipper, Risa skipper, Pahaska, and Simeus all have their larvae <coughs> eating uh, blue grama. And honestly, the grasses are probably what we know least about uh, in terms of what butterflies are eating as caterpillars. Um, so they're probably, these, these, uh, these uh, butterflies, probably their caterpillars are eating other grasses too. Next slide, please. Um, so, what about alien plants? Um, and Talmy talks about this too. You bring in a plant like uh, eucalyptus from, from Australia. In Australia, it's got 250 different insects chewing on it. In the US, there's five. Uh, if you, oh, what about salt cedar, a common invasive shrub in New Mexico? They had to bring in, they'd import an insect uh, to chew on it. Because it was a beetle, I think, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, because there weren't any insects in, uh, in uh, New Mexico that would just naturally eat it. So um, we think of these plants, these aliens, as kind of being bug free here, which they are, but back in their native lands, they weren't. They had their herbivores too. Uh, but here they're, you know, kind of uh, they run, run loose. Um, I, and I kind of like the term ecologically inert. Uh, it's probably not strictly true for all of them, but um, I guess it just kind of resonates for me. Um, next, please.
Sorry, choir. I apologize. <laughs> yeah, here they become part of the human footprint where habitat used to be. So, yeah, never mind. I'm <laughs> Go ahead. Next. Something to remember. Yeah. When you think about how widespread some of these invasive alien plants are, uh, you realize uh, you know how much of our ecosystem is uh, you know resources are being used: water, sunlight, soil. All these things are being used, and we're not getting anything out of it. Next, please. This is the tree from hell. Where's that grow? Yeah. <laughs> well, it grows in Santa Fe. I can tell you that. You guys know that one? No. You don't know it? Oh, you lucky ducks. Well, it's coming. <laughs> Did you guys see the results of the Taos tree survey? No. <laughs> you didn't? Somebody did. You didn't, really? It disappeared in the Santa Fe newspaper. Just recently? Uh, within the last six months, I think. Oh. Yeah. And uh, I wish Santa Fe would do one. But here, guess what they found? Siberian elm. No, sorry, Siberian elm. Yeah. Uh, black locust. All not. Those are non-natives. Uh, what else do we have here? Uh, I guess the rest are all arguably native until you get to the other. I guarantee you, if they couldn't recognize it, it was not a local tree either. Uh, so, um, yeah. So this is other. This is. Siberian so elm, black locust, those are all non natives. That's like the majority of the trees in Taos. But other, it probably means they didn't recognize them. So. And I can tell you in my neighborhood in Santa Fe, it would be very similar. Very similar. You have old dying cottonwoods, and then uh, you have uh, a few big elms, uh, ornamentally planted eastern hackberry. A couple of ponderosa pine, a couple of honey locust, uh, and then scattered in, you know, growing up through the hedges, growing up through your chamisa bushes. It's all Siberian elms. Take it over. <laughs> Next. Okay. So you guys, uh, people who work with plants, you guys are at the base of the food webs. Okay. And uh, success in getting native plants uh, restored uh, is just going to have multiplier effects up the ecosystem. And uh, if you're looking at it from an ecological point of view, then the best way to support your local e ecosystems, the best way to have birds, native birds, is to plant native plants. It's a very persuasive message. I can't believe Audubon saw it, but they, but they did. So that's pretty awesome. Next. <clears throat> um, how are you guys doing? Good. Good. Okay, I will. Uh, I'll try to zip through this. If you are, you know, contemplating what butterflies you might be able to pull into your yard, um, and which plants to plant so that you'll be appealing to the females who can lay eggs, um, I'll go through a few for you so you know the plants. Um, if you live in a reasonably urbanized area like I do, um, it's tough for most butterflies. All their habitat is elsewhere. Uh, but if you have my book, right here, I talk about 30 species that are here, there, and everywhere. They're very widespread, very common, not very choosy when it comes to <laughs> placing eggs on plants. And so those are the kinds that if you're in a somewhat urbanized area, a regular city neighborhood with some green, but a lot of concrete, a lot of glass, uh, houses, and some non-native plants, then those 30 are the, should be your starting point. Don't worry about Colorado hair streaks and uh, these you know, grassland skippers. Uh, think about, uh, well, here you can think about these, actually. Uh, because they're host plants, two-tailed swallowtails, uh, host plants are these three trees. And I think they will all grow here. Choke cherry obviously does. Hop tree might, maybe a little high. You have hop tree here? 
also called wafer ash, telia trifoliata, and velvet ash, uh, choke cherry, go with choke cherry. Here's an adult, here's a caterpillar. For, um, for uh, butterflies that are big and have large caterpillars, they can go with the, I'm a, bird, I'm a, a piece of bird poop, they'll bother eating me. They can go with that until they get too large. And then they start looking like leaves and they'll, they'll, they'll silk the leaf together to make a little house for themselves. Next, please. That's next. Oh, we talked about black swallowtail at dinner. Black swallowtails occur nationwide. Uh, they do eat non-native plants as long as they're in the carrot family. How many, of you, how many of you are raising black swallowtails at your house? One, two, three, four, five. At my house, they're eating parsley. Um, but they also will eat dill and fennel. But if you want to stick with natives, then uh, mountain parsley works uh, very well as well. Here's the caterpillar. And there's the adult. So that butterfly is adapted pretty well to human gardening patterns. Next. Oh, variegated fritillary. That's a state with another statewide wandering butterfly. Here's the adult up here. Here's the caterpillar. Again, it's in that family with all these stay away from me uh, defenses. Females will lay eggs on plants in the violet family, including pansies, and flax family. Uh, so yellow, yellow flax, uh, common roadside blue flax, all work. So those are not hard to get because the butterflies wander around and they will find you have a big patch of pansies or a big patch, a big strip of blue flax, there's a good chance you will get females to lay eggs. And then if you then look for these, then you'll know that one of these came by and that'll be part of your, your little zoo. Next. We talked about Arizona sister already. Next. Myers Admiral, you have up in, uh, I would say, probably 7,500 to 9,000 feet in your mountain uh, streamside habitats. Um, females lay eggs on deciduous trees and shrubs. Aspen, cottonwood, willows. Here's a caterpillar. Doesn't look very good to eat, does it? <laughs> um, next. Sorry? How many of you live in a, a willowy neighborhood? All right. So willows are a really important plant. We saw earlier it was high up the list of plants that are important host plants for butterflies. And uh, morning cloak which you've probably seen flying around already this spring. Yeah. Uh, so they, this is their preferred larval host plant. This is where the females like to lay their eggs. They will, if necessary, use other deciduous trees as well, but they really prefer willows. And females lay eggs, uh, most butterflies will place eggs one at a time. So the caterpillars aren't competing with each other for food. Uh, morning cloaks, lay them in bunches. And I guess that means that uh, you just want to be the last caterpillar left after all the other ones have been eaten. Uh, so if you have a patch of willows, eggs are being laid right now probably from the overwintering adults. And probably within a few weeks, if you just look through your willows and look for kind of this black, uh, I don't want to call it a mass, but black where there should be green. Um, and sometimes if you catch them early, there's lots of them and they're itty bitty. And if you catch them late, there might just be one or two left. And you know what happened to the rest of them. Next. A uh, couple of the commas, angle wings. This is the hoary comma, which you have up in your mountains. Gooseberries and currants are a bit of important host plants for them. Next. Painted ladies. Um, yeah, thistles are what they like to lay eggs on. 
we were talking about thistles earlier because uh, Bob Savinsky came out with this beautiful new guide to New Mexico's native thistles. Next. I tried to go through all my slides that I had, all the butterflies that I actually had photographs of larvae for. There are a couple of lights. Uh, these guys are flying right now, I mean during the day. Uh, southwestern orange tips and the next one also. They fly in the spring as soon as it's warm enough. Um, and they are herbivores in the mustard family. Now if you know mustards, at least most mustards, I'm no expert, but uh, mustards are right after it, first thing in the spring. They sprout, they grow, they bloom, they go to seed. And orange tips, uh, the spring white, which is next, uh, uh, they overwinter as eggs, is that right? No, chrysalises, sorry. And then the adults come out as soon as they can. They mate and they lay eggs on these developing mustards. And those eggs hatch and those caterpillars have to develop just as fast as the mustards are. If the mustards go to seed and senesce and the caterpillar hasn't finished eating, uh, that's, you can't eat the browned, you know, crispy, crunchy, dried up mustards. So they move, they eat very quickly and uh, they follow right in line with uh, the mustard phenology. Spring white, same deal. Here you can see this is a large caterpillar. Well, it's not that big. But this plant is making seeds and this caterpillar is probably about ready to pupate. So everything worked out for that. Um, this is probably, the checkered white is probably our most widespread butterfly in New Mexico. It's also a mustard feeder when it's cat a caterpillar, but they're really not very choosy. And roadside tansy mustard is just fine. Uh, after a fire, uh, the mustards are one of the first things to colonize the burned ground, and checkered whites are in there with them. Yes, sir? Is this the one you see in alfalfa fields? Uh, probably not. Probably not. That's probably uh, the orange sulfur or the clouded sulfur. And they, some, those have high percentage of al albino females. So they kind of look white. Yeah. Good question. Rocky Mountain good plant, <coughs> good plant to have for lots of reasons. Good, good plant for other pollinators. Um, let's, uh, here's another buckwheat and another, another butterfly that uses it. Okay, uh, the lupins, um, you guys probably you know, have a decent shot at getting a couple of the interesting blues, but you have to plant lots of lupins, lots of silvery lupin is what we plant in Santa Fe. And of course they, all the blues, a lot of the hair streaks have ants tending the larvae. Oh, there's so much to learn. <laughs> Next. We're just going to zoom through. Uh, next. Next. We already talked about bramble hair streak. Next. We talked about that. Oh, okay. So the last thing I want to mention is uh, talk a little bit about monarch butterflies. Um, monarch butterflies, as you guys know, uh, they feed milkweed to their offspring. And um, the uh, the way agriculture is, industrial agriculture in the Great Plains nowadays uh, involves uh, genetically modified crops that are Roundup or herbicide resistant. Okay, so large swaths of the Great Plains are being herbicided uh, for the benefit of the crops and our stomachs. And as a result, the milkweeds are disappearing. So uh, there's a big move afoot now to, uh, to learn everything we can about milkweeds and monarchs and to do some restoration work, uh, especially in the Midwest where it's really needed. And here in New Mexico, uh, there's a lot of information, but it's never been written up. So I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm writing that up right now. Um, and what I'm finding is that there's lots of stuff, lots of gaps in our data gaps in our information and our knowledge. And so I would be thrilled if uh, one or more of you would take an interest in milkweeds. 
Uh, milkweeds are almost like orchids in terms of their flower structure and the, uh, the weird uh, shapes uh, they, they, that they get to in terms of uh, attracting pollinators. Their pollination scheme is very bizarre. Um, it's a very interesting group. We don't know, uh, well we know uh, showy milkweed is used here in Taos County in a lot of places, but there's lots of other milkweed species too. So, next slide please. Is that the, um, the bottom left, is that the antelope horns milkweed? No, I don't have a picture of antelope horns. Oh, okay. Horns. This right. is probably uh, uh, horsetail milkweed or coral milkweed. This is showy milkweed. That is butterfly milkweed. Yeah, there, we're, there's about half a dozen species that we know post monarchs, but we have 27 species in the state that we just don't know about yet. So, <clears throat> so we're trying to, um, how many of you go on to citizen science websites and, and register your observations? Oh, there's a whole new thing you could be doing. Yes. Awesome. <laughs> um, so, if you, are, if you are observing monarchs, if you see a monarch, take a picture of it with your smartphone and log into Journey North. Uh, and I'll, t I'll show you that website a bit, in a minute. And then uh, if you see a milkweed, especially if it's in bloom and is you know, identifiable, take a picture of that. And next slide we'll show you where to send this information. Uh, New Mexico is joining the Southwest Monarch Study, and we're trying to uh, figure out monarch life cycle, monarch dynamics in New Mexico. So this is the Journey North site here, www.learner.org. Uh, that website is one that gives people almost anything that moves in a migratory fashion. Uh, hummingbirds, robins, Monarch butterflies. Now they're tracking tulip blooms north. So it's kind of a, uh, you, get on, you can get on their website, you fill out a fairly, a fairly uh, quick and dirty summary of what you saw, where you saw it, upload a picture if you have it, and then they'll ask you to put a dot on, on the map for where you are. And everybody across North America is doing that. You can see the maps and you can watch the monarch uh, the, the northward migration in spring is, uh, is going on right now. You can watch it. You can track it. You can contribute to it. Um, I don't have a... For Apple products, there's an app, the Monarch SOS app. Uh, so I can't tell you much about it, but I know it's out there, and pretty soon there'll be one for my Android. Uh, then you can use that to record your Monarch information. That information will go to Journey North, it will go to Southwest Monarch Study. Yeah. Okay? If you want to know, learn more about the Southwest Monarch Study, here's their website. As part of that effort, we're probably going to be, we will be tagging monarchs this summer. We'll be tagging uh, certainly up at the Wild Rivers Recreation Area, uh, probably in late August. And we may be tagging at uh, Aria Verde. So there's going to be some opportunities for you to participate. How do you tag? How do we tag? Yeah. Uh, big old can of spray paint. <laughs> uh, see this monarch up there? It's that little blue oval disc. Uh, it's got an adhesive backing. It's got um, identifier information on it. Just peel it off the sheet and paste it onto that part of the butterfly's wing, the cell, the hind wing cell, is what they call that. And by tagging here, we're hoping that uh, we'll, we'll find the, those monarchs farther south in New Mexico along the Rio Grande, which is, where, which is what we think their pathway is. And ultimately, it'd be nice to have somebody pick them up in the Mexican overwintering site as well. There's only been one, one monarch tagged in New Mexico that's ever been recovered in Mexico. So we really lack data. We really need more information. So that's what we're trying to do next. And uh, yeah, so milkweeds. You guys are plant people. MLMP, Monarch Larva Monitoring Project. Again, it's a nationwide uh, outfit run out of uh, University of Minnesota. 
and Minnesota thinks they're the headquarters of monarch life. And, uh, and they have the citizen participation that basically <laughs> proves it. Well, we need to get some New Mexico reports in there. So, if you find monarch larvae, take a picture and uh, get your dot on the map. Um, if you don't want to do that, then uh, my colleague, Linda DeLay, is gathering up New Mexico milkweed data as well, uh, so we can map map that. Next. Am I done yet? Yes. <laughs> Here's where our passions meet. <laughs> anyway, thanks very much. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Yes, sir. Uh, what kind of temperatures, low temperatures, can, can butterflies tolerate? Because this time of year, we're getting some pretty extreme ranges yeah. right now. Yeah. Um, you know, they're, they're pretty tolerant. Um, you're concerned that they're going to be freezing at night? Is that the... Yeah, just curious. Uh, yeah. yeah. You know, the ones that uh, are, where their life cycles have them flying now, early in the year, um, it's not a problem. Uh, of course, if you ended up, if you tonight went down to, you know, zero or something, that might push them beyond what they're able to tolerate. Um, summer butterflies are less tolerant. Cool season butterflies are more tolerant. And I guess the bigger question you might be wondering is, well, where do butterflies go in the winter? And the monarch has its plan. Um, everything else basically overwinters here, but usually as an egg, a partially grown larva, or a chrysalis. There's maybe half a dozen that will overwinter as an adult. Morning cloak is one example. Most of them are, and what they do is um, they convert their body fluids to a, um, a glycol. <clears throat> Whatever stage they're in, that's kind of how they defeat the cold, the cold winter. Yeah. Yes? What's the difference between a moth and a butterfly? Very little. Very little. Um, I guess if you're, if, you, if you're trying to separate them in your hand, or you're looking at one trying to figure out what it is, the best thing to look at is the antennas. Butterflies always have, uh, let's back up here, I can show you. That's as good as, good as good as any. Butterflies always have a swelling or a knob at the end. Ah, see that right there? Yeah, it's not a ball, but that's where a lot of the olfactory senses are, uh, sen uh, sensors. Um, so butterflies always have a swelling or a knob at the end. Sometimes it's twisted or hooked or whatever. But moths never have that. They're just plain. Moths have much more interesting things going on with their antennas. Uh, many different uh, morphologies. Uh, and it's related to, um, you know, their ecological difference mostly is that moths are nighttime flyers daytime hiders. Butterflies are daytime flyers, nighttime hiders. And so a lot of what we see in terms of their appearance, their behaviors, uh, are all, uh, they all stem from that choice that they made at some time in the past. Um, <clears throat> moths are, most moths don't see very well. It's dark, nothing to see anyway, but their olfactory senses are much more highly developed. So you hear stories about uh, this male cecropia moth is able to detect one molecule of the female pheromone at a distance of three miles. You know, and then it can fly up wind to find it. A butterfly could never do that. Butterflies fly during the day. Uh, they do have some olfactory capabilities, but they're limited. And they're much more visual. Very keen eyesight. Um, and uh, so their, and their wing patterns are such that they're dealing with visual predators. 
moths are dealing with echolocating predators, which affects the way they fly, all that kind of stuff. Okay. So the recognition of the plant in which the butterfly is is that the visual? I think it's a combination of visual and olfactory. Females of most butterfly species have olfactory detectors in their feet. So they can, they land on something and it, hopefully it's confirming what they think they saw. That yes, it's a milkweed if it's, if it's their monarch or it's a choke cherry if they're a two-tailed swallowtail. Yeah. Other questions? Well, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I hope to see some of you at a monarch tagging event later this summer.